Did you know you can only find their gear at Target? It's true. So hurry over. Blog Talk Radio. Hey kids, it's Friday and it's hot. Um, it is the 10th of July and I couldn't be ever more excited than I am at this exact moment because shortly we'll be hosting Richard Graff. Um, to those of you that don't know, you might be recognizing him uh, even though he's had a ton of different TV and film roles. One of the most important or most recognizable, I should say, or what they're calling is a groundbreaking role for him is uh, in the AMC series, The Making of the Mob, which is... Uh, in part, the story of Lucky Luciano. And he, of course, is very fortunate and blessed to have been given that lead role character. So I'm very excited to be talking to him about that, some of his former TV roles. You'd be surprised to find out some of the things about this young man um, that not everybody might know. So I'm very excited about that. I want to give a quick reminder about next week, uh, show schedule, Monday and Tuesday, I will be off. Uh, Wednesday is my birthday. And yes, I'm going to be having an actual birthday show, but um, honestly, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm working on three different um, three different guests, uh, one of which is my absolute favorite of all time, one of my biggest screen idols ever. Um, so hopefully, with any luck at all, we'll get an opportunity to be able to host one, if not two, of the people that I really want to have on the show. So I'm very excited for that. So wait to see, uh, wait to find out specifically who I'm going to have on Wednesday. And then of course on Thursday, the 16th, we're going to be doing actor Brian Benson and he'll be coming on the show at four o'clock central standard time. And then of course we have two more of Dana's clients at 12 or one o'clock on the 17th on Friday. So please tune in and listen to that. As far as that goes, Dana's clients are uh, all pet industry clients, but they're absolutely wonderful. Also do not want to make uh, a point to forget about this one, reminding everybody to New York City, big ventures, me, big supporters of both. First off, um, Rich Malavente uh, has his Frank Sinatra debut, July 10th and July 24th. Tonight I was so hoping to be there. Unfortunately, I won't be. My hope or expectation is I'll be in New York City for the 24th performance. Metropolitan Room this evening starts at 7 o'clock. So big shout-out to you, Richard, and to Victor. Good luck. I hope everything goes very well. Second of all, Mr. Steve Stanulis is having at the Cutting Room this coming Monday, July 13th. Tickets are still available, $35. Cutting Room, Silver Shield Foundation, it's for the benefit, having an all-male review. And let me just tell you this much. If Stanulis decides to get a little risque, you're going to enjoy it. It's going to be absolutely wonderful, and it's all for a very good cause. So please go out and support Steve Stanulis, his friends, and his endeavors as it relates to that. To those of you that may not know, Steve Stanulis, of course, is – the director, um, or excuse me, the director, the lead actor, and it's his production company along with the absolute one of the finest independent uh, directors that I know in New York City, John Gallagher, produced the Networker together, which I just did a review for not so long ago. So please, as I said, please make it a point to support their endeavors. Um, I just I can't even begin to describe the quality of talent that they've pulled together and such. Also, don't want to forget to remind everybody that the Long Island Film Festival is going on this weekend, so please do make it a point to participate as it relates to going to see independent film. Um, unfortunately, I myself, once again, am not able to attend. Am I very frustrated about this? Yes, I am. And I really, really wanted to go and show my support to my friends, unfortunately. Um, I also got a side note here from Miss Donna McKenna. That Leaves of the Trees is going to be premiering. It's actually, I think it's their actual premiere premiere this coming Tuesday the 14th. I'll be posting that information up on my Facebook page for anybody that happens to be in New York and the surrounding area. If you want to go ahead and check that film out. I am told that it's an amazing, amazing film. So I'm very excited to get some feedback, find out from other individuals what their thoughts are on this. So hopefully with any luck at all, you guys can um, fill me in, let me know what's going on, tell me the story about Leaves of the Trees, or uh, just kind of give me just general feedback because I'm going to turn around and do a review uh, of Donna's casting. And of course, Eric Roberts is in that film, Armando Sandhi, along with a couple other people. So without further ado, we have Richard. So I'm going to start talking to him. I'm so excited. All right, let's see what he's got to say to us. Hi. Hey, how are you? Oh, very nervous and very excited. How are you? How was the flight? Oh, it was great. Great. Everything was good. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, good. So you're settled and everything is wonderful. So terrific. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of different questions for you. So basically how we'll do this is I'll just keep asking you questions. And if anybody happens to call in, I will um, let them kind of intercede and ask you questions, if that's okay with you. Of course. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. Well, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about – 
you're a Gerber baby, which I didn't know. And I think that's really cool because <sighs> I'm like, I've never met a Gerber baby before. So what does it feel like to be the face of Gerber? I know you're a grown man now, but it's like, tell the, tell the cute little story about Gerber. It was, uh, it's interesting. Like before I even left the hospital as a baby, there must've been a nurse or, uh, someone at the hospital that was in the entertainment business or in the commercial business that they were waiting for my parents as I was coming out mm-hmm. and they, they offered mm-hmm. to put me on the Gerber label. It's a really ah! weird story. Yeah. Yeah. They must've, <laughs> they must've really seen cute. this little bit. I mean, the weird thing is when I was, you know, when I was young, I was born with a full head of blonde, platinum blonde hair, and I had very long eyelashes, so I kind of looked like a girl. So I was a very oh pretty boy. Oh, my God. Yeah. Aw, look at that. Yes, well, I hate to break the news to you, but you're a very pretty man, for lack of a better term. Oh, thank if you. If you guys have seen the look at the Millennium Magazine, <laughs> he's on the cover of July 2015. He is on the cover of Millennium Magazine, which is absolutely awesome. And, yes, you'll see his little pretty face there. He's had some changes. I've seen your Facebook page, so I've looked and kind of seen the progression of you. Um and all that good stuff. So tell me a little bit about, I know that age six, you had your actual first performance, if you will, and that's relatively young. I've always been fascinated with people that started at such a young age. So at the age of six, tell us a little bit about your first performance, and at what point did you discover or realize that, yeah, this acting thing is really my passion. It's what I really want to do. I just think, you know, I I think for the most part, it's, it's, a, it's something that's like inbred that, you just you're just driven to entertain people you just kind of like driven to not only entertain but almost entertain yourself by by seeing other people entertained by you so it's one of those things okay. that you know the the reward is being able to know that people are gaining joy or learning something from what you're doing on stage or whether it's uh through film or whatever it is you know it's just i think it's just one of those things that you, you kind of I don't want to say that you're born with could because you know you're not born with everything but there there is something that that drives you naturally there's one of one of those things you know Yes I know exactly what you're talking about something that, well you, and I think you can feel it in the pit of your stomach I get excited writing an interview I get excited writing anything um and so I, I totally, totally understand what you're talking about. Uh, now, my question for you is, to those that don't know, of course, uh, you have done poetry before, uh, which I've done as well, obviously. You've, you've authored and penciled certain things. Tell me the difference for you between writing and, and performing. Um, which do you gravitate on? My guess is, obviously, you're a natural inbred actor. But what made you gravitate towards the poetry side of things? Well, I mean, my bachelor's degree was in literature and writing. And so we did a lot of a lot of poetry, and you know, I, I really gravitated, I really gravitated toward uh, William Blake as a college student. Uh, okay. I just think the imagery and the uh, the kind of you know, it, it's weird. Like William Blake was writing, you know, a long time ago, but he almost has that kind of Kierkegaard kind of like self reflection kind of uh, writing style that a lot of us in today's day and age kind of you know, strive toward. Uh, I think right. the the thing about, you know, good writing is that it drives cinema and it drives drama. You know, without good writing, without good dialogue, you know, it's dead before it even hits the, it, it hits the table. So sure. uh, writing, writing is where it all begins really. If you, and if you don't know the, the proper tenor, the proper, you know, uh, the way uh, the style of, of saying and, and dialoguing before you actually become a performer, it, it's hard. You, I, I almost think that you should kind of like learn how to be a good writer before you become a good, good performer because it, it, to- it totally mm. helps, definitely helps. Ooh, I like that. Actually, I have had no actor come on the show and say that before, so kudos to you. I like that. I'm going to use that line. That's really cool. Um, have you ever, or have you ever considered, or would consider, I should say, petting a, a screenplay, if you will, or a play? I, I could envision you putting something together, if you haven't already, for those small screen or large screen or even a theater house. Have you even considered that, or right. would you? I, I see, You know, you, you always hear about <clears throat> entertainers or people in the art industry kind of saying, Oh yeah, I'm an actor and I'm a, I'm a musician as well. Oh, and I also do some writing, but I'm the, I'm of the opinion that, you know, you have to really succeed in one thing and you really have to kind of focus on one thing because if you don't really focus all of your energy on one thing, then you're not doing it enough. And the time that you have off, if you're spending that doing something else, 
then you're mm-hmm. taking away from your downtime where you can have some kind of self-reflection and you can have like some kind of, you know, self-awareness of things you need to work on for the thing that you really want to focus on. So I'm really of the opinion that, you know, you need to succeed in one thing in order to to get the credibility to be able to break out in other avenues, you know? I, I, that's that's yeah. my opinion, I, that's what I think. Nice. You know, and it's interesting that you brought that up. To, I was reading your bio, and, and there's a note that's in there that says, and folks, you should listen to this, and, it, and it's notated that you are actually – you learned how to play instruments by being ear taught, which I always find is unusual because I have friends that are self taught as well. So if I were to ask you, are you proficient? Would you consider yourself proficient in any kind of instrumentation, instrumentational playing, I should say? And if so, what do you play well? Well, when I was young, I started playing the horn, the piano, the drums. But well, what was happening is, is that I was, as I was practicing, I was finding that rather than looking at the notes if I were to just kind of memorize what it sounded like, I could mm-hmm. kind of mimic it by practicing it and going and correcting myself as I was practicing rather than looking at the notes and practicing. So, hmm. I, you know, I, it's what's called kind of like, you have to have kind of what's, what's called pitch perfect ear. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I have, it's a, it's a little scary sometimes. Like I can I can listen to a song and I will know exactly where the notes were taken from from another song that I heard like 15 years ago. You know, you have to okay. kind of like be able to like not only understand what key is played in, but memorize things. You know, it's like well, I think it's one of the reasons why I'm so good at memorizing scripts is I'm able to kind okay. of memorize things and I'm, I'm able to memor- uh, remember things very well. Ah. Interesting you bring that up, actually. I have a, a side note question here for you that was forwarded to me by one of your fans. They said, well, ask them this question. And this this probably pertains to a good number of actors. Is there a so-called trick of the trade, whether it be for you or actors in general, um, a way to make memorization of long periods of dialogue easier for yourself? Hmm. Uh-huh. I think what I did, what I started to do was when I was when I was in school, and I wasn't even studying acting. I was just trying to study for essays that were given by by my professors. They would give us uh, the topics for essays, and what I would do okay. is I would re- I would write the essays a day or two before the exam, and I would rewrite it twenty, thirty times. And by the time it came to the oh test, I would be able to rewrite the essay from rote, so I wouldn't even have to think about it. I would just rewrite it. It's really? kind of it's, it's really strange to hear about that, but that's what I would do. Yeah. Ah, I gotcha. Okay, yeah, because everybody's got their own little tricks. Some people I've heard use mnemonics and things like that, or some people have cheat notes. And every actor, every person right. is different, obviously. Oh, uh, certainly. Um, obviously, I know you've mentioned before your parents were born in Sicily, and of course, I know at one given point in time, obviously, you've said uh, repeatedly that you have had to cook for yourself, cook for other people, etc. So at this stage of the game now, because you are getting to become a very well-known actor, do you even have time to cook anymore? Do you still enjoy doing that? Is that something that's a priority for you? Of course, yeah. Listen, I'm I'm the type of person that I would rather eat a home-cooked meal than to, to go out and get something uh, you know, and it's so hard to do because in New York City or Los Angeles or any big city for that matter, mm-hmm. it's so easy to go out and get something quick to eat and 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 relatively kind of you know inexpensive. But I I kind of like taking the time to create something in the kitchen and to have something that's kind of home cooked. I just it was the way I was brought up. You know, I mean, both right. my parents being born in Sicily and having and cooking at home every day of the year. You know, it was just one of those things that was ingrained. You were at the dinner table every day, every night at 6 p.m., you know, everyone. Okay. So it's just the way it was. Ah, look at that. Now, here's an interesting question. Uh, again, some of you might not know, certainly along with you having your BA, you also have a law degree. Um, and I guess it wasn't really clear in the research that I did. Have you ever utilized that or wanted to utilize it, or did it come in handy for you um, role-wise or otherwise ever at any <clears throat> point in time? Uh you know, in all of my studies that I've had, in, or rather my bachelor's degree or my graduate degree, I think the only, the really thing that really helped me was A, uh, reading and being a well-read human being, being able to know several different topics, 
and and B, as I said, memorizing things, being able to kind of recall events and and even more so the emotions of people, what they were going through, and understanding the humanity of the people that I was reading about. I think that's what helped in terms of my acting career okay. now. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Sure. Well, of course, I understand. Um, I know that uh, from an acting standpoint, I know that you've studied, obviously, uh, just to name the two, Peter Minor, of course, and, and Wynne Henman. This is my question. Who on set, and it could be anywhere, TV, film, or otherwise, has kind of been your best mentor where you stood by them or shadowed them or watched them and learned the most about how to be a better actor? Who would you say that might be? Oh, Wow. You know, as I was growing up, I, as I was growing up, I really kind of I gravitated toward I gravitated toward the comedic kind of actors, and it's, and it's funny because I never get cast in anything comedic, really. I mean, I've gotten cast in a couple of things, right. but not as much as I'd want to. Like a John Ritter from Three's Company, always kind of made me laugh. I mean, it was before my time, but still watching the reruns, it still makes me okay. laugh. Uh, so many other actors that that were in that vein of comedy. Um, okay. It kind of it kind of brings you it kind of brings you to a spot where it's very very innocent, and yet very open. Uh, you know, just to to like the the everyday kind of person where the funny thing happens when no one's looking. I think that's what uh-huh. that's what really kind of drives me home as an actor. Yeah. Okay, I've got gotcha. you. Yeah, I know you had made a, a mention of this. I read this in a particular article that you had an, a, a specific admiration for Al Pacino's portrayal in The Godfather. And so I wanted to ask you about mm-hmm. that. I thought to myself, um, what is it about his performance that you appreciated so much? And did you use any of that in your current performance? You know, there, there was, a, I remember when I first started acting, I took my, my first, well, one of my first classes. And they did a, they did, an experiment. I guess it was a, more of a kind of a class project, and they said, "Okay, we're going to take the five highest uh, characters in a deck of cards, playing cards, and that would be ten, jack, uh, queen, king, and ace. And uh, you know, ace is the highest card. Well, actually, they made king the highest card, so they didn't put the mm-hmm. ace in. And so, what we want mm-hmm. you to do is act like act like these characters are in real life, and when I got the king, I just kind of stood there. And it's it, it it's the correct way of doing it because when you're the king, all you have to do is be. And if you do anything else, if you try to be the king, if you try to rule, and if you try to scream and make people do what you want them to do, then no one's going to listen because all you have to do to be the king is be, really. So I think right. Pacino did it well when he played uh, the Godfather in the Godfather two and one uh, is he sure. just kind of you know he was very soft spoken he was um, very non threatening in the kind of materialistic way you know he kind of never forced anyone's hand but in the end you mm-hmm. knew that he ruled just because he he was ruling and, and that's right. what I took to to the role of playing Lucky Luciano in the making of Mob which is on AMC at 10 p.m. every Monday yeah. by the way. <laughs> uh, yes, we're going to get into that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I. Uh, he, Go ahead. I'm so, no, no, no. I was just going to say. I, I think what he did was very, very, very intelligent. You know, is just, just to kind of, you know, you, whatever character you are, when it's a kind of, when it's in a position of power, you never have to try to do it. It should just happen. So that's what I said. Sure. Of course. Definitely. Now, one of the things that I know, and I've heard this from other individuals, when I first watched the program myself and I turned on AMC and I'm watching this and I'm looking at you. Now, mind you, folks, as you're listening to me, uh, I have not seen Rich Graff perform up until this point in time. When I first started researching him or even thinking about interviewing him, I started to watch the AMC show first. And one thing that resonates to me and many of your fans and people that watch you is we're very curious to find out from you if that intensity that you magnify through the look on your face on a continual basis, and it seems to be in almost every scene, if that's inbred, because I at least almost believe that it's in you, literally in you, that intensity, that fierceness, that ferociousness as it relates to your passion um, just comes across in your role. Or did you have yeah. to learn that? Well, no, it it is. It is me. I mean, I grew up in, I grew up in New York City. 
And um, mm-hmm. not only that, but I grew up around some of the uh, my best friend's dads were some of the characters that you see in some of the the recent mobster movies. So I knew mm-hmm. I grew up around kind of the mafia lifestyle, if you will. Um, you know, <clears throat> it, it was it, it, I I wasn't involved in it. My family wasn't involved, but it was in the environment. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where you grew up from a very early age and you grew up in a, very quickly because you kind of saw, like, when I was young, I'd be 11 years old and my friend's older brothers disappeared, you know, or, you know, this person would be involved in the news and this person was, dad was in the movies and, you know, he was portrayed in the movies. Um, so it was, you know, growing up in that way, you didn't have a, a regular childhood where you drove around in a bicycle and you know you were in the park and, and this and that it was it was different right. it was it was very different sure. and you grew up you grew up very very quickly and very fast and you know there's good parts to it and of course there are bad parts to it but as you said there, I, there is an intensity that's very real and I, I think it, it lends itself to success for the role Oh, definitely. Without a doubt, certainly. Um, And, of course, obviously, I've asked other actors this, but in this particular case, obviously, the person that you're playing is clearly deceased, et cetera, and it's not like you have a whole lot of, I'm guessing, relatives to to run in and ask about. So what did you find was your your best resource or reference point, I should say, to get closer to this character? I didn't want to just do research on Lucky Luciano. I didn't want to just kind of, like, look at what he what he did in his life and kind of emulate it in any way. What I wanted to do was really <clears throat> find out the funny things about him and, you know, the things that were kind of quirky about him. Because it's very easy to play a tough guy. It's very easy to play someone mm-hmm. that wears fancy clothes and drives a fancy car and gets all the, the ladies on his, on his arm. You know, th- those are all th- – th- that could be very, very, very – well done on cinema, on camera. But what I wanted to do is kind of like show the quirkiness and funniness about him and show that he had a kind of sense of humor because all those other things I could naturally do given, you know, given, given the way I was raised in the environment that I grew up in, I I knew those people and I knew, I knew what they were like, but what I wanted Mm -hmm. to do was really kind of, you know, show the funny side, not just the funny side of Lucky Luciano, but the kind of, the, the the human side of him, the one, the part that was, you know, we, people tend to forget that he was an immigrant. He was an immigrant from Sicily that had nothing. They came here with his family, with, and they had no, virtually nothing in their pockets, and they built an empire that still exists today. So it wasn't that he was born with all this money. He developed an empire, and and you know, and I, I think he kept a sense of humor about himself, and that's what I wanted to, that's what I really wanted to drive home. Gotcha. I got it. Yes, because for some actors, of course, it's more important, and, and that was my next question to you. Was it more important that you embodied his characteristics as a person, or uh, is it less, or is it just as important to you, I should say, to to capture his physique? Because honestly, that's the one thing I didn't get to look at was what he actually physically looked like. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, let's ask Rich. Do you feel that you you emulate his physical presence as well, or did that actually physically take makeup and work, etc.? No, as an actor, you're never going to you're never going to be able to do what anyone else does, whether it be a, peop, a person of interest in history or your next door neighbor. You're never never going to be able to do exactly what they do the way they do it. So, and if you do, it's going to be a failure before it hits the screen. So, my my, my main goal was to kind of drive home what he was like, what was going on in the inside of Lucky Luciano, what was going in his head and the reasoning behind what he was doing and maybe what was going on that he didn't want anyone else to know about. Because I think that's the most interesting part of of a human being is to be able to kind of let people see inside the, the, the windows of the eye and to see what's going on when they're not, when no one's looking, you know, I, that's what I really wanted to kind of, kind of drive home as well. Gotcha. Okay, now this is just a fan question because, yes, I am a fan of the show, but I found out this little fun fact that some people may not have picked up on. Um, 
your show is narrated by Ray Liotta, which I think is awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, that he's a fantasy husband of mine in my head right now, um, or has been for years, <sighs> I should say. So I'm just curious, have you, have you met him? Have you ever had a chance to actually do any kind of work with him or at least chat with him or get any hindsight from him? Because I, I, I mean, he's infamous obviously for again, playing the bad guy, so to speak. So, right, um, right. Well, look, you know, you Ray, look, I've had I've had some chats with Ray on social media. Never had the chance to to meet him personally, but you know, people think people seem to think of him as like, you know, and I think that's true of of anyone in in movies or television. They kind of they take what they portray on TV and they kind of and they kind of superimpose it on that person's character automatically. And that that's just not the case, right. of course. You know, Ray was a I think he was born and bred in Boston. If correct me if I'm wrong, or he was or, or New York, think, somewhere on the East Coast. I want to say and New York. He moved but to, you might be right on the Boston. I think Go somewhere ahead. on the East Coast, for that matter. And he moved yeah. to Los Angeles when things weren't going right for him. And then he slowly started to kind of get some success in Los Angeles. So, but he, he's you know he's a very very professional person. First of all, he doesn't have. You know, it doesn't have a a, a, um, a mafioso quote unquote bone about him. Uh, but okay. you know, he's a very nice guy. The, the good the good thing about Ray is that he has he has a good guy uh, persona, but he has a kind of like a bad guy kind of <laughs> physical appearance about him. So you can play that kind sure. of good guy that you trust in the beginning, who kind of turns on you in the end, <laughs> which is kind of which, which is kind of interesting, I think. Oh, definitely. I would agree with you. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, I've I've had some friends who have met him before and have said nice things. I also know that you had attended Tribeca this year. And if I'm not mistaken, Goodfellas, I know, was at the very tail end of the festival. So I thought to myself, well, hey, I wonder if they were kind of hobnobbing together or if you got a chance to attend that. Um, or in general, I guess. No, I was, I was, no, I was, I was at the, uh, I was at a couple of premieres the, the day before uh, the Goodfellas did a 25th anniversary ah, uh, screening gotcha. went on. Uh, yeah, so I did not get a chance to see the cast of Goodfellas. I wish I, I wish I could have. I would, I actually okay. flown out the day, that day to go, uh, to do a film somewhere else. But I, yeah, I, I was at Tribeca this year. I was at Tribeca last year with the film that I had done, uh, which actually won a bunch of awards, which is 1971. It was a documentary yeah. about, uh, people who broke into the FBI offices and published a bunch of, uh, a bunch of reports about who were spying on citizens. Uh, in mm-hmm. 1971, it was a really great, really good documentary film. Uh, yeah, people should check that out. Very, very interesting. Yes, I was just reading about that the other day, as a matter of fact. Now, I bring up Tribeca for a reason, of course. I was just there not so long ago, and I did coverage and interviews for Soho Film Festival. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of my actor friends and I talk about this. So I just want to get your feel for um, it, there seems to be an ongoing trend nowadays where a lot of the actors, bigger names, little smaller names, independent film in general, indie films are really becoming the trend nowadays, if you will. It would seem as though a lot of actors are becoming employed and engaged more so in the independent circuit. So I'm curious to find out your take on um, why you feel independent film is so pertinent nowadays. What, why is this well, becoming a trend? You know, you look at the feature films, big budget feature films, you know, the, the, the one reason why they're failing is because the people who are producing these films, what they're doing is they're casting the actors based on how many people they can guarantee that particular actor will bring to the theater. So it, they're really kind of not making a movie. They're just making money. They, you know, they're saying, okay, this actor will bring this money, many people to the theater and this actor will bring this many. So they're not really kind of like saying, okay, this actor really embodies this role or this actor will bring this to the role. They're just kind of making money. And I think that's one of the negative things about Hollywood right now. Whereas with independent film, they're kind of trying to really create something original, really create, you know, life on the screen. And I think that's why independent films have been doing so well. And that's why you have all of these film festivals that are popping up all around, not only the country, but all around the world, really. Definitely. I would agree with you. And I and I think that there is a, a whole lot of merit in what was said not so long ago. One of my friends who's a director, he had said to me, he's like, you know, this gives an opportunity to, you know, you have some of the bigger name stars that are actually saying, yeah, I'll cut my salary. I'll do this. We'll do a reduction in this and this and this. They, It's more about getting the project done than it is about, you know, we need to make $6 million, like what you're talking about. So 
So I have a huge, mm. huge admiration for this art. It's, it's very, very exciting. Um, I, I think. I'm yeah, and sometimes, so listen, sometimes it's not. It's not the. Sometimes it's not the director's fault, or you know, sometimes you just have too many people making checks and balances, and having too much sure. say involved in when producing a film. When you and when sure. you have too many, too many people pulling on too many strings, you know, it it, it doesn't turn out right, and that's just the way it is. You betcha. Now, I want to talk a bit about your actual acting style, and I know you probably don't get that. Hopefully you don't get asked this a lot because I hope this is a unique question. I'm a, I myself am intrigued, and some of my fellow friends who are actors that are first starting out wanted to know this question. Would you consider yourself, if I were to say, are you more of a method actor? I had a couple of people on my show who follow the works of Stanislavski very closely. If I were to ask you acting uh, style or what you like to utilize most often, what would you say? Well, first, let me say that, uh, you know, I would say personally I'm, I'm more method than anything else. Now, I studied with, okay. I studied with Peter Miner, as you said, uh, who, mm-hmm. you know, is, is kind of like a person that teaches his own way and teaches his students very uniquely. I also studied with Wynn Hammond, who happens, who happens to be uh, – uh, God, what's his name? Assistant um, Meisner, uh, Meisner's assistant. Okay, you know yeah. the Meisner technique. Okay, he was yeah. uh, he was actually Meisner's assistant. Um, ah. And, and Win Hammond now actually has his own school. He's not, Win is actually ninety three years old right now. Uh, oh my and, But he does not teach he does not teach the Meisner technique. Uh, he teaches his own kind of method. But for huh. myself, really, you know, I, I'm I'm of the be- belief that every actor brings his own personality uh, to the forefront of his per- his or her performance. So, okay. you know, being method in, in your acting really not only kind of lends itself to kind of trying to experience or use other experiences in in order to perform, but memory. Okay. And the feelings of the memories that were going on in your body when they were occurring. So it's a combination of a lot of things. You know, I always I always think that it's good to kind of learn a lot of different things from a lot of different people because ultimately it's those little things are kind of accessories to what you already bring to the table, and they, they can help yeah. you. Oh, definitely. Absolutely, without a doubt. Now, um, interestingly enough, The Making of the Mob is on the AMC network. Um, you obviously mm-hmm. have done work in other avenues, obviously 30 Rock Law and Order, so that's obviously more regular broadcasting. Right. I've talked to other actors, like I, I just had somebody on who did a Netflix production and somebody before that who was on HBO. So here's my question to you. Do you for you personally, as a person, personally and professionally, do you prefer to work with a network such as AMC because they give you more liberties versus working on regular network television? Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, it's, you know what? Who knows what, as, a, as an actor who may not get a, a, a lead role in something on a network show right now uh, mm-hmm. or, or beforehand, uh, I might not have the freedom or the liberties to kind of change the script or to kind of suggest things, of course. Uh, sure. But I think when you're working on an independent film or when you're working for an HBO or a Cinemax or an AMC, for that matter, something that doesn't have the standards and pores, like an NBC right. or a CBS or an ABC, uh, you can take certain freedoms and liberties and and okay. creative uh, creative spontaneity that you couldn't do with those other network shows. You know, and I think that's why, I think that's why HBO, Smash, all these kind of like Hulu and, and all these internet kind of television shows are, are being so successful because you can kind of sure. push the envelope a little bit more than you can with the network television. So, I mean, look, of course the money, the, the money is more prevalent in the network television, but I think the ability mm-hmm. to be more creative and, and to, to produce some original programming is, is is definitely much more relevant in these other other avenues. Yes. Gotcha. I see what you mean. No, and I agree with you. I, I do. I guess the only other question relative to that point would be this. Um, and and clearly you're playing Luckily Luciana, so this might be a contradictory question to ask, but 
You Do you see this trend, in, and I hear this often, is that a lot of the docudramas or television series and episodes are not only becoming more dramatic, but much more violent, almost to the point of um, excessive, almost excessive in the mm. drama and the violence area. Would you concur with that, or do you think that we're still in a relatively comfortable area? Uh, you know, it, it all depends on what one considers violent. Um, I mean... And, and or what one considers, um, you know, too violent for television. In terms of the making of the mob, which is on AMC at 10 p.m. every Monday, I, I don't think that it's. <laughs> I don't think that it's, it pushes the envelope of violence at all. I honestly don't. Okay. I think there are some scenes where, you know, they, they do kind of show how barbaric and and, and how murderous these people were. But it's, right. it's it's a fraction of it's a fraction of what the entire story is about, really. Um, sure. All right. You know, and, and, and you know what? There's been a, there's been a big uh, push on television where they say sex, drugs, and violence sells on TV, and I think that's slowly right. declining. I, I think that the writing is what's selling on TV, and I think that the making of the mob on AMC at 10 p.m. every Monday is what the writing is what's driving the show, really. I, I honestly think that. <laughs> That's very good promo there. I, I see there. how you appreciate how I'm plugging the show every chance I, I get. I do. I appreciate <laughs> that. But now I'm going to throw you up against the wall because, hello, you were on 666 Park Avenue. And, yes, I think I prefaced this two days ago. I'm a closet freak. I love 666 Park Avenue. You were on that show. Uh, what the hell happened? Because it's gone now. Never finished. Well, it like just you know, disappeared. There's so many there's there, there's so many times that a person can watch a vampire kill another person. I mean, <laughs> that's that, that's my opinion. You know, really? uh, of course. You know, listen. A lot of there's a lot of television shows that last only three, four, five episodes, and right. that misses on network television, of course. And sure. I think it has a, it has a lot to do with initial ratings because a show that premieres or that's in a second mm-hmm. episode or third episode, sells a lot more mm-hmm. commercial space than a show that's in its seventh or eighth episode in the first season where the the network might not even think it, it'll last for a second season. So there's a lot of money okay. to be made in commercial space on television. And, and I think that's I think I think the networks want to create new programming in order to spell more, sell more commercial space, you know? No, I know exactly what you're talking about. And and when I was looking at your resume, I thought to myself, okay, well, you know what? This is typical, if I would call it typical, Rich, you know, because you've got the AMC thing. You've done Fugitive Chronicles, 666 Park Avenue, Law and & Order. And then, lo and behold, here's 30 Rock. So that's why I wanted to ask you, I'm like, this this just doesn't seem like you. Because I'm like, okay, I've never met this guy before. But all these different dramatic roles, it almost seems like your cesspool of comfort would rely upon drama, honestly. I mean, it's hard for me to picture you – being the ha-ha, funny, funny. Do you know what I mean? So I'm uh-huh. curious what gravitated well, the, the you role, to 30 the Rock. Role that I was, the, in, in terms of 30 Rock, I was kind of, <laughs> I was the antithesis of the ha-ha-ha. I was really, right. uh, Tina Fey was kind of disturbing this uh, talk show uh, on the episode, and she was kind of causing a ruckus, and I was playing a security escort, and I, was, and I just kind of told her, let's go get, get your butt out of here. <laughs> sure. Uh, and Tina was great to work with, by the way. Really, really professional actress. Uh, but I would listen. Oh. I love being on these kind of. I love being on the comedy shows because um, I, I have this. I have a kind of very serious exterior, but on the inside, I'm very, very. I'm always kind of joking around. With, you know, I, I, I love the comedy shows. I love it. Really. Yeah, okay, no, no, I, I just I'm have serious. to make this. I, I got to tell you, I got to make this statement because again, it's not just a person interviewing you, but I'm going to tell you right now. I've talked to at least thirty people, and I've said to them, "Just tell me your overall impression of this guy." I said, I told him, I said, "Watch three different things. Don't just watch AMC." I said, "Watch him in three different things." This is my feedback, and this is the majority of the other people. This is it can <laughs> simply be put like this: You just frighten me. You scare me. You scare me in AMC. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, you're. You know why? Because if if I was, if I met you and you were portraying your character right now and I walked into the room, I'd think to myself, I don't even know if I want to be at the same table with this person. So I don't know if you take that uh, critically you know or what? You it's, take, it's, if that's what you're going after. It's the brown contacts. It's the brown. <laughs> really? 
know, the, yeah, they put brown they put brown contacts in my. I honestly think, I honestly think that the way they dress you, and there's a lot of different things that go, that go into it. Um, you know, I, I, I you, the other thing is that I, I can I'm very my my strong suit is playing the very serious, the very kind of authoritative, and if you quote unquote mm-hmm. will the very scary guy. Uh, I'm very good at that. Because I, you know, I just okay. have a naturally, I have a natural kind of knack for it. But if you were to give me kind of like, I do play. A, listen, there's a there's a a short film that I won a couple of awards for that was on that was in Cannes two years ago, called um, Just Short of Sidekick, where I play yeah. a very lonely kind of uh, janitor, and I befriend a, a, an eight year old student who teaches me about life and how to be a little bit more friendly and kind of a little bit of social, uh, get rid of my kind of social awkwardness. And it's a kind of a comedy and, and it, you know, it, it, it really kind of, I kind of show my softer, if you will, comedy side in it. It's really good. It's a really good short film. Nice. Definitely check Very it out. Nice. You know. Yeah. We, we were just going to talk about that in fact, but before I go to the film side of things, this is what I want to ask. Cause this is what most people usually want to know about an actor that's on TV film or otherwise. Cause of course, everybody always believes that you're superhuman, which means you don't take a dog out or you don't cook for yourself or you don't do anything cause you're an actor. So if we were hanging out with Rich one day in New York City, would we be surprised to see that he is very unlike his TV and film characters? Or what, what's that guy like? What does he like to do? What does he do? On yeah, no, I'm, I'm, a, time? I'm the kind of person. I'm the kind of person that kind of jokes with the cash cash register person at the Starbucks, and you know, like <laughs> talks to strangers, and like you know, makes like like a, a funny comment about someone who trips on the sidewalk in front of them like <laughs> I'm a very kind of like you know I'm, I'm not I'm I'm not a very like I'm not rude in any way but I just okay. I'm a very social person I'm a very kind of you know okay. I'm a very nice person I'm very you know I'm a, I'm in the crowd in the mix kind of person so I could be anywhere and kind of mingle and meet and and talk to really anyone I I think that's one of the things I, I, that I love about myself really is that I can kind of, you know, be anywhere and meet anyone at any time. Very nice. Now, do you ever get a chance to do the snowboarding thing anymore? I was curious because I know you were doing that before. Uh, so. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to be a, you know, a semi-professional snowboarder in college and mm. uh, I, I love, listen, I've traveled around the world, around Europe and the Alps and I've competed in some of the tallest mountains in the world, but, I can't take those risks anymore because if anything were to happen, you know, I, I couldn't work, I couldn't film, and I just can't. I mean, sure. an actor's life, an actor's shelf life as it is, is very short, and I'm trying to make sure. it as long as possible, honestly. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I really, I can't do it anymore. It's not that I don't want to; it's just that I, feel, right. I, I can't risk getting hurt. Yeah. Of course. So on your time off, then, do you do things that are not actor like, or are you still kind of immersed in your passion? Oh, of course, yeah. I do a lot. Of, I do a lot of hiking. Uh, I do a lot of biking. Uh, you know, I, I'm a very, I'm very, I'm at the gym six days a week. Uh, I take wow. women's aerobic classes. <laughs> I'm the only, I'm the only male in the gym, because as an actor, you know, you have to stay as slim as you possibly can. Of course. So, I, like, I stay in the back of the room, and then you have all these women in the front who probably think I'm staring at their rear ends, but I'm just there to really work out, you know? Uh, <laughs> no, I get it. I do. But I get I'm, it. I'm really How do you trying to stay. To... Oh no, go ahead. You're you're staying fit. No, I, was, I was just saying and, I'm, and anybody... I'm trying to stay as slim as I possibly can. That, you know, that's all. Have you looked at yourself? Here's a hint. I just read this <laughs> quote: "New York City heartthrob." That's what they call you. How do you respond to that? How do you react to that? Somebody, you know, people refer to you as a hottie all the time. Heartthrob. I've heard it. I, don't I know, you know you I really, it, but I'm telling you. I, 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 look, I, I'm of the opinion that everybody has their own definition of what attractive is. You know, uh, what one person finds uh, as attractive, another person doesn't, you know. And I, I think what lasts in the end is, you know, being able to kind of adapt and kind of play many roles. Because as, as I said, you know, the shelf life of an actor who just plays like the heartthrob or this or that is very short. 
But when you have an actor that's able to play several different roles and do several different things, that that person can get work for, you know, that person can have what I think is the most valuable thing in acting, and that's longevity. Sure. You know, and that's what I want. Hmm. Now, before I forget, we should talk about your film stuff. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention. But before I do that, I just want to tell you and the listening audience, um, I went behind your back because that's what I do, um, and I've asked other people about who you are and their impressions of you. So I'm sure you'll Great. be curious to hear that. I'm sure you've heard all this already. Um, this is what I know to be true uh, by people that I trust in the industry that either know you, have worked with you, et cetera. And these are the thoughts that they resonated most clearly about you. Um, not of one of them didn't say the word. He's a very hardworking actor who is a real live New Yorker. He's a terrific guy who's very genuine, very talented, and moreover, uh, it's very admirable. Um, case in point, we should talk about this. I know that I'd like the listeners to hear a little bit about, I know that you've done work relative to assisting with both Hurricane Sandy and 911. So can you tell the folks a little bit about what prompted you to want to step up um, and, and why you feel actors as a whole should be integral in, in things such as this? Well, I think anyone, any person should be helping anyone else that needs that needs help. Uh, when 9-11 right. happened, as a, as a born and bred New Yorker, my first instinct was to come and, you know, give water and to help the firemen and the policemen who were, you know, digging. And uh, I just, I was trying to do whatever I, I could do to help other people who were also helping other, other people. Uh, and the same thing goes for Hurricane Sandy. I, I, you know, I grew up not far from the Rockaways where a, a lot of people's houses floated away. And I, I went oh and, and, and I kind of helped people, you know, clean up their house and, you know, try to get the water out of their house. It just, it's a natural instinct. I think it doesn't have anything to do with what you do as a, as a banker, as a, a doctor, anyone. I think it's just a human being. You should, your first instinct should be to help other people when they need it. Yeah. Got a doubt. Certainly. Certainly. Now I know that you brought up yourself, obviously 1971 and just short of sidekick. So if you would please speak a little bit about uh, the two in particular, my dead boyfriend and insurgent, of course, I'm sure people will recognize it. And I know a bunch have heard about it. Talk about the roles in there. Um, and of course, obviously the one thing I know that you worked with Anthony Edwards before you've also, um, did you work with or, or just met John Corbett? Cause I had saw that recently and I thought to myself, two great actors with a lot of, of, character and charisma and and what was that experience like working around them uh well first the uh film insurgent you know it was a great role it was a, a character role uh i was heavily in uh wardrobe and makeup so a lot of people won't recognize me per se uh but it was a, mm -hmm. a great film to work in and of course the third and the, the third installment of that film uh is coming up soon um Oh. Now, my dead boyfriend, my dead boyfriend, directed, of course, by Anthony Edwards, who people mm -hmm. should remember from ER. He was Goose in Top yep. Gun. Uh, <laughs> it, it's his first film that he directed. Uh, it's called My Dead Boyfriend, and Heather Graham and John Corbett are married in the beginning of the film, and John Corbett dies. Mm -hmm. And all these people start to come up to Heather and tell him, tell her all this, this thing that she never knew about her husband, and so she flashes back. Uh, to find out about these things. And in her past, I'm her boyfriend. And the drum of her band, ah. we're in a band together. And so uh, it was great to be, you know, the love interest of a, an A-list actress. Uh, to, to steal a kiss from Heather Graham was, was great as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know she told me it was, as she, for her part, she told me it was great for her as well. Uh, Aw, uh, <laughs> cute, cute, but, uh, very cute. Yeah, no, she's, really, she's really nice. She's a really nice person. Anthony Edwards is awesome. John Corbett was a really nice. Everyone on the set was a real, really, really great to work with. And I think the film is going to do really well because if when it flashes back, it flashes back to the 80s. And everything from the 80s right now is coming back. Everything from right. the ripped jeans to the tie-dye shirts to, you know, everything. So I think that My Dead Boyfriend is going to do really well when it comes out. Oh, you betcha. Now, do we have an anticipated release date for that? I don't. I've been looking, and I've been okay. trying to see when that will come out, but of course, okay. with film and television, timing is everything. Right. Well, of course. That's why I figured, well, since we're on here, we can let them know, obviously. And I know 1971, the documentary. Is there a means or access for individuals to be able to watch or view that? 
Yeah, I mean, it should be. The film has been has run its its gauntlet around the world. I mean, it's been everywhere. Uh, okay. You know, it, and it's it's done in the U.S. So you should definitely be able to look at it online somewhere, and it's the full the full length of the film definitely. Wonderful. Now, before I forget, um, I know, did you or did you not just complete? Because it looks like the notation says you just got done with 79 parts. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, that was directed by Ari Taub. Uh We got okay. done a couple of months ago, uh, filming with uh, Eric Roberts and a couple of other people. Um, yeah, that was a, it's, that's going to be a really interesting film to watch because, again, it flashes back to kind of like the 70s and uh, okay. New York City in the 70s with the kind of like the pimps and the old style <laughs> cops and stuff like that, which is always, cool. an, it's one of those like, one of those eras in time that like people don't want to remember, <laughs> but still exist. Ah, yeah. You know, where the, no. the, the clothing wasn't very good and the music wasn't very good, but people were just kind of in it and they kind of, they, they were all in it per se. But so it's okay. it make it makes for a very interesting and very funny movie actually. Huh, interesting. Now I have two other questions for you before I reel off all this good stuff about you to the folks here. Um, has smoking got any better for you on the set? Because I had read something oh, about it. I'm like, God. oh, don't ever ask Rich Groff to have a cigarette because he's going through like two packs, right? <laughs> so yeah, I mean. It, for uh, the making of the mob, which is on AMC every Monday at 10 p.m. 10 o'clock. Uh, yeah. At 10 o'clock. <laughs> you know, of course, everyone smoked in in the early 1900s, uh, sure. and they smoked non-filtered cigarettes, of course, Camels or Lucky Strikes. And I'm a non-smoker. And uh, when I first got to set, the first day of filming, uh, they were trying to give me these um, herbal cigarettes, these like cloves. And it wasn't the smoke that I was inhaling from the cigarette itself, but rather the outtake, the smoke from the outside of the cigarette that was bothering me so much. And ah. I, I just told them, I said, I can't do this anymore. Just give me the regular cigarettes. And uh, okay. I smoke. I must have been smoking two to three packs of unfiltered cigarettes a day. And for a non-smoker, for a non-smoker, it, you know, it was it was very difficult. And of course, you can oh you have to inhale because if you don't inhale, it looks ridiculous. Uh, when people are walking, right. it doesn't look like you're really smoking. So right. yeah, as a I non-smoker, agree. it was it was really hard. But I, you know, I'm happy to say that my last cigarette for the last take of filming was my last cigarette. So yay, that, that, um, goodness! Um, now, at least I'm happy about that. Yes. Yeah, you're not kidding. Uh, okay, and so you've obviously officially wrapped uh, the AMC thing now. So now that that's all done and over yes. with, if I were to ask you, so. What's going to happen now with Mr. Rich Graff over the next couple of months? Do you have particular things lined up? Because I know many have been talking about how this could very well be your so-called breakout role, meaning the one that defines you and kind of gets you soaring to all sorts of other roles. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm just getting done uh, filming a, a horror film uh, with Ooh. Tom Sizemore uh, from Heat, as you know who he is. Nice. Uh, yes, and I now, do. and now I'm I'm also kind of working on a deal uh, to 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 work with some other people and to work on some other films, things that I can't really go into detail. But uh, right. I think you know, it, it, like, look, when you're when you're not the um, the son or the nephew or related in any way to someone in Hollywood, uh, it's the proof is in the pudding. And so I, right. I, I think I've I put the work out there that shows that I'm able to kind of take on any role I can and really and really do well with it. So my work has been is now going to be paying dividends, and you know things are starting to really snowball for me. And I'm, I'm I just want to enjoy the ride. Really, I just want to enjoy sure. where I am right now, and I'll be totally prepared to where I need to be in the future. Oh, without a doubt, certainly. Now, I guess my other question, I was just sitting here and thinking to myself, are you one of those actors that, you know, some actors refuse to watch themselves? Do you watch yourself? Or oh, no, yeah. I, I think, I, I actually think that's that's one of the things that makes you a better actor because, hmm. you know, you can totally feel as if it, the work looks good, and but until you actually see it on camera, uh, mm-hmm. you, you can't see what you need to change or what can make it better because it, it could always be better. There's always little things sure. that could be better. 
so I think watching yourself perform, you know, or watching the replay of it is is very useful. I mean, I I, I don't think that there's anything other than that that's as useful as that, honestly. So, yeah. Good answer. I like that. Okay, I want to rattle all these things off, and then I have one more thing to tell you before I let you go. To everybody that's listening, um, Rich has a Facebook page, which is his personal page. His last name is spelled G-R-A-F-F. Um, obviously, of course, he's an actor, so he has an IMDB profile, www.amc.com. That's where you can go back and watch all the various episodes of Making of the Mob, which is Monday night at 10 o'clock on AMC, as we mentioned, I think once or twice. He has a Twitter handle, which is at, and that's Rich, and then underscore G-R-A-F-F, which also is parallel for his Instagram account, Also, Millennium Magazine, July 2015 cover. Also, his work has been covered in Star Magazine, along with a number of different various publications. Is there anywhere else where people can find you, social media or otherwise, that I might have missed? No, I think uh, think you've covered everything. It's, you know, Rich Graff, R-I-C-H-G-R-A-F-F, as in Frank. Uh, So, yeah, please, everyone, check me out and, and follow me on all the social media. I'm always posting stuff on there. And I'm always responding to to fans and to people who yes. are asking questions. I, I really I really enjoy interacting with the people on, on social media, actually. Actually, and and I can be truth told to that because obviously I'm watching his page and I can see all these different postings he's done. Now I will admit that I'm very sad that the only person I got to talk to you today, and I haven't seen anybody call you, is me. So I'm very very fortunate. I've had you for almost an hour. So I only have two more That's things okay. to do here, and I will let you go because I know that you are uh, you have work to do in Ohio there, so I don't want to keep you for too long. So there's just two things I want to let you know, the first of which will be a surprise to you because I just found out before I got on that I was going to do this. So let me just share with you something I decided to do. Um, I've done this before. I know you know John Gallagher, the director, the independent filmmaker? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Well, in any case... I went to Soho. I, I have done things in the past that are relative because I'm an author. I'm a longtime uh, published author. And so uh, I was speaking to someone the other day, and I thought to myself, you know what? Let's see what Rich thinks of this idea. So I sat down last night, and I started watching your show, and I've done a, a full-length review of the show and your performance. Um, I did the same thing for Gallagher, and I did the same thing for Kelsey O'Brien. And then we went, and, and we started talking to people, and we went, and, and we're looking to start publishing it all over the place. And I thought to myself, I wonder if it would help your cause at all and get another two, 3,000 friends of mine to watch your show if I post this little review of you and your show. Um, so I thought if that was okay with you that I would do that this weekend. Of course, of course. Please be my guest. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, it, 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 it's a wonderful show, and I have to tell you that. I, and it's not just because, of course, obviously, I, I'm a huge admirer of Lucky Luciano. He was one of my favorite gangsters of all time, which is one of the number one reasons I approached you to come on my show, because I admire him greatly. Um, you know, but it's a wonderful show, and it, and it goes well beyond just the, the good fellow sort of thing, where, it's, you know, you're seeing all sorts of whacking and this, that, and the other thing. There's substance right. to it. There's right. merit to it. It's a great story, and I think it's wonderful. So the only other thing I want to leave you with is um, I end my show always with telling people what I think of them. So this is my two minutes to tell you, Rich Graff, what I think of you. And then you can go. um, And and you will be given an invitation, by the way. My birthday is coming up shortly, and I will be in New York City the 22nd or 23rd of the month. So if you're around and you would love to celebrate with me, I'd love to have you, if you're free. Great. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so here's what I'm going to tell you before we wrap this up. So, Rich Graff, these are my impressions, and I only tell you this because I want you to know this, but moreover, I want the listening audience to know my impressions of you, and hopefully after they start listening to this interview from start to finish, they'll get the same sense of you that I do, which is the very first time I approached him, I was scared to death. And why? Because I had already been given this wonderful impression by actors and producers and people that knew him of this upstanding, terrific guy. But he just looked like he could kick my ass in 35 seconds. And I thought, this guy is never going to talk to me. He's never going to come on my show. Very surprisingly to me, he was warm and welcoming and friendly and intelligent and versed in his craft. He was very accommodating. He was very respectful. I've watched some of his performances. And one of the best and most remarkable parts of your performances are, not only are they all very unique and different, but they're all unique to you, meaning that I think if another actor tried to parallel you in any way that you act or speak or the way you present yourself, it wouldn't be the same. 
your individual style is yours and yours alone. You are not over the top. You're not a prima donna. I'm very happy to see that because arrogance doesn't do very well with me. And I think that Lucky Luciano is just one of about 17 roles that already established you as being a wonderful character actor. And if there's ever another point in time where you need some promotion or you need somebody to attend something, or if you just want to come back on and talk, know that you have an open invitation. That's it. Well, thank you. Those are really those are really kind <laughs> words, and I have to say, thank it, you. It's, it's from the beginning of, of speaking with you. It's always been a pleasure. I've I've always uh, admired and appreciated your professionalism. And anytime thank that you. you want me back on the show, please just let me know, and, and I'll be there. Oh my goodness, I would really appreciate that, definitely. And good luck this weekend in Ohio. I hope everything goes well, and I will remind everybody to watch. And I'm going to post all this information up after uh, I let you go. And good luck, and we'll please, be watching uh, every, on Monday. Every, Thank you. Every Monday at 10 p.m. on AMC, you can watch AMC. the Making of the Mob and watch Rich Graf, uh <laughs> rise yeah. and and also fall. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. And smoke cigarettes he doesn't want, so we all know that. And, There's and a smoke and smoke unfiltered people. cigarettes. That's right. That's right. Yes. That's exactly right. All right, dear. Good luck this weekend. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. All right. All right, kids. That was Rich Graff. Isn't he amazing? And as I said, I meant every word that I said. It was absolutely wonderful interview. A great opportunity to spend some time with a wonderful man. I want to remind everybody again that he has a Facebook profile, which is first name Rich, last name G-R-A-F-F. Now, with the Twitter handle, you're going to do the at symbol and then Rich and then underscore with the last name. Instagram. Same thing. Obviously, of course, all information and prior episodes for The Making of the Mob is www.amc.com. Obviously, as he reminded you, and I will one more time, 10 o'clock on Mondays, and typically if you watch my Facebook page, you'll see, of course, that I'll be pumping the show as well because I am a fan. As previously mentioned, we have to wait for, I believe, and I should have asked Rich, but I'm sure maybe it's even out by now, July edition of uh, Millennium Magazine, which is available in New York City. He is the cover man this month, so check that out. Star Magazine, for those of you who read the entertainment individuals uh, and uh, everywhere else, literally, this guy is being interviewed left, right, and sideways on social media, newspapers, and otherwise. Don't want to forget, of course, obviously, if you wish to see all of his prior television and film work, check out his IMD profile. IMDB, now you know I've been talking too long, profile. <laughs> Once again, huge big love and hugs and thanks to Rich Graff for taking the time to call me all the way from Ohio because he is on another set working on some more stuff. Want to remind everybody one more time, I am off the 13th and the 14th of radio, the 15th. Watch either my show page or my Facebook page to find out who the surprise guest is. I'm not going to lie to you. I've already hit up Kurt Sutter. I've hit up Cher. I've hit up two other actors who are my fantasy four. So wait to see what happens there. Four o'clock Central Standard Time on the 16th, we will have Brian Benson. And then, of course, Amy and Anna, which are, of course, two pet client suppliers of Dana Humphreys, will be on from 12 till 2 o'clock on Friday the 17th. So please make it a point to tune in and listen to any of my four shows next week. I want to remind everybody, without a doubt, two different things on a local side. If you wish to see me tonight, I will be down at the Fish Fry and a Flick. Beetlejuice is playing. Michael Keaton's another fantasy person we haven't had on the show yet, but Hope Springs Eternal. So I will be down at the Flick. But first, to those of you who are Chanel fans, Chanel Lameau, either watching her with the Squeezettes or the Dapper Cads, from 4.30 to 6.30, and then she will be playing with the Squeezettes at 8.30. And if by some chance, if you happen to be out on the Tosa side of things, my very, very dear friend Marcel Goyton is playing over at the Art and Paint Bar for the very first time with his little piano, so you may want to check that out. Also, Amy Ashby with Incorruptible over at the Best Place Tavern, going to be on tonight from 7 until 8.30. Please make it a point to support local music. Before I forget one more time, Richard Malavente, dear friend of mine, so sorry that I cannot attend this evening. Seven o'clock, he's going to be playing his Sinatra show. You might want to check that out. That's at the Metropolitan Room and make it a point. July 13th, kids, Steve Staniolis is at the Cutting Room to benefit the Silver Shield Foundation. All this information will be posted up on my page. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for taking the time to support my endeavors one more time. I don't want to say thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart, as I have said millions of times before, to those of you who have just been here with a hand, excuse me, a hand, an ear, and your heart uh, without asking too many questions. Trust me when I tell you that it means more to me than I can ever tell you. Um, so thank you. 
Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy your weekend. Um, and if you come up with any crazy, wonderful, off-the-cuff, spontaneous ideas for me for my birthday, just message me. I'll see you guys next week, Wednesday. What you doing? Ran out of space on my phone, so I'm deleting some stuff. Bye, singing dog. Bye, goal. I pronounce you. Bye, wedding ceremony. Stop. At Metro PCS, you get two free phones with twice as much memory. Really? Don't say bye to your memories. Switch to Metro PCS and get two free LG K20 Plus phones with 32 gigs when you switch two lines. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the T Mobile network. See store for details and terms and conditions. All you need is love. We love the beat bugs. And Target is the only place you can find them and all their gear. Come join the fun and jam with us. Love is all you need.